Welcome to the last part of the plenary session one. And I ask you to please be seated so that we can continue. The first speaker of this part is Juan Pedro Montavez from the uh, University of Murcia in Spain, and he will talk on the impact of climate change on photovoltaic power generation in Europe. Please. Okay, thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to present a work performed by several people involved in the Cordex European project. And Sonia Jerez couldn't come here, um, and she's the, the main author. So, the question is that uh, renewable energy are presented, are usually presented as the, of one of the tools that we have for fighting against climate change. The question now is how climate change can modify the... Um, the renewable energy resources. In this world, we try to answer this question, is how, cli uh, how climate change could affect the future of the PV sector in Europe. There are several ways that climate change can affect this thing. The first one is by altering the socioeconomic factors, including energy demand. I mean, in a future climate, we have different climates, so the energy demand can change in several ways. But this is not our the question that we want to answer now. The other way of altering is that the power generation potential can change because climate conditions change. How can, can we address this? The, um, the power generation potential can be represented like the solar radiation in, at the surface, and at performance ratio, that depends on the device conditions. These device conditions depend also on meteorological conditions, such as radiation at surface, temperature, and wind. So, now the next question is how will climate change in the future? I mean, we know how to do this. I mean, we, the first thing is to create some uh, scenarios of uh, radiative, uh, I mean, some scenarios for uh, future conditions. In the, in the last uh, IBCC, they used the representative concentration pathways that provide some estimation of the future radiation forcing under diverse socioeconomic assumptions. In this work, we are going to use two of these uh, scenarios, the RCP 8.5 and the RCP 4.5. The first one is uh, a very dramatic change, and the second one is a, let's say, moderate uh, scenario. So, now, once we have this uh, scenario, we, put, uh, we fit uh, some general circulation models with these scenarios that we obtain some future climate change projection. The next step will be to perform some downscaling exercise. In our case, you use uh, 10 members of the Eurocordex ensemble of high resolution climate simulation that covered the period from uh, 1970 to the end of this century. So, the thing is that why to use a lot of model or a lot of integration? Because, I mean, every model is able to reproduce a physically consistent estimation of the future. But we have a lot of uncertainties on that. So the idea is just to try to get a full description of these uncertainties too when we plan to give some uh, um, a scenario for the future. So, First results, we just present the differences between these two periods, a, pre a period in the present and a period in the future, at the end of this cycle. So the nice result here is that we obtained with this 
I mean, we are represented here the, the mean, the ensemble mean of these uh, uh, models. And the first is that we have a reduction, the blue colors are reduction, in the north part of Europe, while we obtain an increase of solar radiation at surface in the southern part. The gray areas mean that there is not a significant signal. Um, but the question is, when we calculate the potential, uh, the solar power potential, we obtain a reduction, a small reduction, at, in, all the, in the whole Europe. Europe sorry. Then, what's happening here? The thing is that uh, the solar device depends on meteorological conditions. Then changes in these meteorological conditions affect the performance of this uh, device. Then uh, here, for example, we can s split what are the factors uh, involved, uh, or the meteorological factor involved in this strange behavior. We can see here that uh, for the future, we, um, the models uh, reproduce an increase of temperature. This is clean home temperature. It makes that this device doesn't work very well in, at this high temperature condition. So we have a reduction there of the, the, the potential, the, of, uh, of, of the power that this device can give. And on the other hand, we can see that the changes uh, um, for the future in wind speed doesn't affect our production. Okay. So. What's, um, uh, what's going on with the uh, different uh, scenarios, so with, with the different RCPs? So for the 8.5, I have presented the result, but the, for the 4.5, uh, we have an uh, increase in the south of, uh, because the temperature is not increasing so much, so these devices are not effective. So the question is, okay, this is the results just for solar radiation and for uh, the potential power or solar power in each point. But do this projection of P PV pot uh, actually impact PV power generation? So the next step is how much uh, power, solar power we will have in the future. For this task, we use the clean mix model by Jerez et al to spatialize the targets proposed by the European Climate Foundation in its 80% in its renewable energy supply pathway. In this, that table, you, you, you can see what is the, P, the PV installed capacity in the future. So we, uh, we are going to fix just in two regions, in the region one, that is uh, here, Scandinavia, and the region four, that is Spain, okay? So, this clean mix model uh, just distributes where the power plant should be in this scenario. More details of, about this uh, model you can find in this paper. So, if we uh, look at the region one, that is, on, I mean, in, in Scandinavia, I mean, we, we are going not to install a very big amount of solar uh, device. But in Spain, for example, yes. In the case of, um, in the, case of the region one, Scandinavia, we can see that we have a decrease in the future of the power potential, of solar power potential. But in a region like Spain or the Iberian Peninsula, we have almost no change. The different colors means the different ensembles of models. The blue ones are for the 4.5 scenario, and the, um, and the orange one is for the 8.5 uh, scenario. So also, we can see this uh, plot there that means the uh, ANOVA analysis of the variance that give us information about which, uh, uh, which term, I mean, the RCP, the GCM, or the, RS, or the uh, regional climate model has more importance in the uncertainty of the future. So we can see here in the region that in, the, in Scandinavia, in region one, 
that, for example, the main answer, uh, source of uncertainty is the a scenario. While uh, in Spain, at the end of the cycle, or in the Iberian Peninsula, mainly the main um, source of uncertainty is the regional model. So this is quite nice because we see that the uncertainty related with each one of the steps that we do when we perform this kind of studies is different in the different areas. So what about the impact on the PV generation? If we look at all these uh, uh, areas, again, we focus in the Scandinavia, we have a strong reduction. Each point means the value of one member of the example, um, of the ensemble, and the orange, um, and the other one, and the different colors for the different scenarios. We see that a strong, well, strong a reduction around 10% or 6% in the case of Scandinavia, almost no reduction in the case of Spain. Also, we can see how changed the interannual variability, the monthly variability, or even the daily variability. This is important. I mean, because sometimes the variability in this kind of energy resources is important. For the case of Scandinavia, we have almost no change, or no significant change. There is some disagreement with the different members of the ensemble. But uh, the nice result here is the daily variability, that we, can s we, we see that there is almost no change in Scandinavia. But for example, in the Iberian Peninsula, we have a reduction of the daily variability. That means that we have more stability in the energy production. So, then concluding, uh, the question, does climate change threaten the future of the PV sector in Europe? Well, the first point is overall mean PV supply will undergo a slight decrease, the largest in northern countries, where they hardly overpass 50%. But, I mean, in northern countries, the proposition for the future is not really solar energy, it's more wind energy or other kinds of energy. So the time variability of PV supply does not appear as strongly as affected, showing even a slightly higher temporal stability in southern countries. I think this is good. So other studies also did not identify the strong changes. Also. Our studies also in agreement with some other studies. But then, therefore, Climate change is unlikely to compromise the European development of photovoltaics. So people that want to invest in this kind of energy, at the moment, uh, uh, this will be not a problem. So, but nevertheless, we have to worry a little bit more about that, and we have some uncertainties that still remain, like the difference, different models provide different results. In particular, and this is quite important, we uh, have different, uh, quite different results be, uh, between uh, uh, GCMs and uh, regional climate models. Also, we, uh, indirect effects of aerosol and land use changes were not considered. We have a a future project that we are developing right now, and we try to answer this question. And also, we, we did not consider uh, the teal of uh, the PV panels uh, in this work. So, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, uh, Juan Pedro, and uh, we have time for a couple of short questions. Um, I see two hands over there. <coughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, recently, I did a, an overview of uh, what the Eurocodex model have used for. Uh, sorry. Recently, I performed an overview of what the Eurocodex model have used as aerosols uh, scenario. Hmm. It seems that most of them did not use any change in the aerosol concentration of the scenario. So I don't know if you were aware or not. And if you try to sort out in your 10-member ensemble the model that were including the aerosol scenario, also for the direct effect, not for the indirect, just for the direct effects, from the model who do 
include this, uh, this scenario of aerosol change? Yeah, it would be nice to do And does, does it change? I mean, did you try? And does it change the results over yeah. your... Thank you for your... I mean, it, this is a good idea. The thing is, is that even we have more, in the, more, more experiment, but we finish the work and later more experiment come to us. But finally, we decide not to include more, more experiment at all. But, I mean, I think that we have to include all these new uh, integration and all these uh, effects when possible. I don't know if I understood correctly. No. <laughs> so you can repeat, please. I mean, I mean the, the surface shortwave in Europe, the evolution of the surface shortwave in Europe would be very strongly related to cloud cover change and also to aerosol load change. And it seems that in most of the Eurocordex scenario today, there is no aerosol change. Okay. So yeah. probably in some of the area you have shown, the change in the shortwave could be completely different to, from what you have uh, assessed up to now. Yeah. Because one of the two main forcing of the shortwave change is not there in most of the model. Yeah, but the question is, I mean, how much can aerosol affect the radiation at surface? I mean, for example, I think the cloudless is much important than this. I don't know. I'm not so sure, especially if you are on a, on a low emission scenario, for example. Hmm. I don't know. Okay, one more question, and then I think we will... Yeah. Hello. Uh, I was just wondering if you are able to separate which processes are contributing to your decrease, especially in the Scandinavian region. Is it, is it clouds or aerosols or water vapor? And if it's clouds, as, as, I, as I would guess, uh, do you have a sense of, of how the models are representing present-day clouds and whether this representation of present-day clouds is... Uh, is something that gives you confidence on, on, on that you can see a signal in the future? Wow, this is the key question. Yeah, in principle, uh, the reduction is mainly due to an increase of uh, clouds. The, we found that the, in the GCMs, the response is totally opposite. We have more radiation. And now there is some people writing a paper about that because it's not simple at all. We really don't know what's going on. Uh, probably in a couple of months or something, we will have some more results about that. In fact, there is people working on that in order to understand this question, but I can no answer. But the main factor is that in the regional models, we have an increase of this cloud. Okay, thank you to Juan Pedro. And, um, okay. And we will uh, invite the next speaker, Erika Coppola from ICTP in Italy. And she will talk on <coughs> assessments of multiple daily precipitation statistics in air interim driven med cortex and eurocortex experiments against high resolution observations. Please go ahead. <laughs> of the work. Yeah. Is it working? Yes. Okay. So good afternoon, everybody. First of all, I would like to acknowledge all the co authors of the work. There are many, and I am happy to be here in behalf of all of them. In this work, uh, uh, the main purpose of the work is to assess uh, this uh, ensemble of med cortex and eurocortex uh, simulation era individual driven against uh, extreme precipitation statistics and also to compare the two ensemble among themselves because as you know over Europe there are these two big group of uh, cortex and they are running on a um, quite uh, coincident domain 
So it's a useful information, especially for the end user, to assess the value of both simulation. Uh, what we use are nine um, era interim driven model, and with uh, two resolutions, so for the high resolution 011 and 044, and we will compare and analyze the result on three common grid, the 011, 044, and 1.5 degree, that is uh, uh, the resolution of the boundary driven era interim simulation for most of the run. And then we will use a high resolution observation data set. There are nine different data sets on different regions over Europe. And we will take into account the problem of the undercatchment correction using the uh, UDAL uh, precipitation data set for the monthly correction. So these are the regions where we have the uh, observation. Uh, there are a few more regions compared to previous work that has been done on the same, uh, with the same observation. And these are the model. Uh, the, cho the choice of the model has no any particular uh, reason. We don't have all of them just simply because they were not available on the public archive or because they were late or something like that. So we took from the archive whatever was there at the moment in which we start the study. Uh, what we will use, uh, so as I told you in the beginning, the main purpose is to assess the model against extreme precipitation statistics. So we will use uh, only two, oops, two indicators for the mean climate, so just the standard bias and the Taylor diagram, and then we will focus more on these indices like PDF of daily precipitation, intensity, the mean daily intensity precipitation, mean, dry day, mean frequency of dry day, 95th percentile of the dry spell length, that is something a little bit more different different from the standard CDD. And then the, um, what we use instead of the R95 percentile, we use this modified index that basically sum up all, all the precipitation above the 95th percentile, where the 95th percentile is the one calculated for the observation for each of the resolutions. So we uh, only consider the 95th percentile of the observation. So to start with, I choose the fall season to show you the, uh, clim uh, the mean climate evaluation. The fall season, be because around the Mediterranean, the fall season, as you can see from the observation, is a season where you have a lot of precipitation. So in your lower um, row, you have the observation at three different resolutions, so 1.5, 044, 011. And in the upper row, you have the model. So the driving model, the era interim, the ensemble of the 044 and the 011 ensemble. Uh, as you may see clearly, although this is just uh, the climate, uh, uh, the seasonal average, we can already see something that is appearing. So you can compare the 011 ensemble with the observation. You can see how it's well resolved, the precipitation in the south part of France and in the north of Spain. And this is not so clear when you compare, it's not there when you compare the 044. So there is already an int there. And this is also clear if you look at the seasonal, the first seasonal Taylor diagram plot. And if you do look at them at all, the resolution, so I will go back and forth a few, few times, oops. You see that basically the red plot are the high resolution ensemble, the letter indicates the different region we are looking at, but the general picture is that 011 score better for each of the, res of the resolution, and this is becoming more confusing if the resolution is lowering. Of, of. So this is done for the mean climate, so let's move to the extreme that is really the focus of the paper. The first thing we looked at are the standard PDF. So these are just daily PDF of the uh, precipitation. And I'm really happy to, to see that after I started to plot this kind of PDF like uh, two, three years ago, and immediately when we start to evaluate the high resolution model, there was a need we realized there was a need of high resolution observation because we couldn't compare the model. And then after a few years, finally, we found this high resolution, at least in Europe. And we are happy to see that the color, the colors, the color code is always the same. So the, the red is for the high resolution. In most of the region, the high resolution are the only one able to capture the tail of the distribution compared to the observation that are in green. 
if we move to some specially distributed index, so this is the intensity index over three different regions somewhere together. So here we are using, again, uh, kind of matrix uh, um, format. So you have observation on the first column at different resolutions, so the low, the middle, and the high. Then you have the model, the arrangement driving. So here you have the ensemble of all the RCM, so Euro and Met Cortex together for the 044 and 011 resolution. And here you have the two ensembles separated for the two resolution. These are three different regions with three different data sets. So we are using basically a data set for France, one for the Alpine, and one for the Italian peninsula. And they are just shown together. As you can see, it's quite uh, clear that with this extreme index, only the 011 ensemble for both um, MAD and Euro and old ensemble is able to well capture the intensity of precipitation over the Alps and in the, in the famous... Uh, Golf of Lyon that is very uh, much used in, uh, in France to evaluate model, and also along the Apennine and the west coast of Italy, where we are prone to have like uh, cyclone, summer cyclone, and fall events that will uh, generate a lot of damage, like floods uh, that we had in the past. So if we move to a different... Um, index and different region. This is the uh, replacement for the 95th percentile, and this is England. Same, uh, same, um, same uh, displacement, but of course we missed the, the med cortex ensemble because med cortex doesn't go the, up there. So again, if we compare 044 with the 011, we see that this signal is completely missed from the observation if we uh, look at the west coast uh, of England. And of course, we have one example for each of the region, for each of the index, but I'm not going to show now. As a summary, I can show the daily, uh, the um, Taylor plot for all the four index we were using. So these are the four index, and these are the Taylor plot as before. Same color scale, so we can see that on, this, on all the resolution, and this is only the higher one, the 011, the uh, ensemble, high resolution ensemble score better, not as good as in all the indices. And in particular, we see that we have some uh, more confused signal and lower the, the grade the performance for the, dry, uh, for the dry indices, so for the DDF and the CDD95. And if we look, for example, at the annual cycle of the uh, dry day frequency over the, the wall, uh, uh, over the nine region, we see that um, although we are looking at the result of high resolution, so the, on the 011 grid, the high resolution doesn't help to add value to this kind of index. So we still have that most everywhere, most of the ensemble of the high resolution is uh, lower than the observation. So we are underestimating this index, and this is due to the drizzle phenomenon. So we can say that even Adding, uh, increasing the resolution doesn't help for this uh, kind of problem. Uh, so, as a conclu conclusion, I would like to suggest that this uh, study, uh, I think, show a, rem a remarkable performance for uh, the spatial pattern annual cycle and all the metrics for all the board ensemble. Uh, and it's clear the add value of the high resolution. And this is also retained, uh, this add value is retained when everything is upscaled. So this is not only due to a uh, spatial uh, increased resolution, but it's also due to some uh, increased physics behind. The performance of the model are improved compared to the previous generation of RCM, like for example, Ensemble, in which it was not really clear the added value when the, high resolution, when the resolution was increased. Both ensemble have a similar performance, and they are both of sufficient quality to be applied in climate projection to be used for impact study. Some of the metrics, as I said before, have still some uh, problem due to the drizzle, 
And so this means that this is not enough to increase the resolution to solve this problem. And there, is, there are some indications from other study that this problem may, may, may be um, ameliorated with the convection permitting uh, simulation. And last but not least, but the most important one is that, of course, we, if we want to keep working on this uh, uh, kind of uh, problem, there is a clearly uh, need of high resolution quality check observation data set for the entire European territory because we need it to assess all the future simulation that will be done. Thank you, Erica. Very interesting talk. Um, we have time for a couple of questions. I see Linda there. Uh, thanks, Eric. Actually, I have two small questions, but they're really small. Um, uh, one is, um, I note that um, Ireland and Portugal are not on the map at all, so I'm just curious as to it's why. Be because we don't have observation over there. I only show a region where we have the high-resolution observation data set available. Ah, okay. So, so those... So those would have to be coming from the individual countries, basically? Yes, or from projects involving more country. Okay. And then secondly, I'm just wondering about, you know, it's very nice to have that resolution and see how things improve with the resolution. Um, I guess this is a question about uh, whether or not there was ever consideration to do simulations at point two two to see if there's this let's say, linear improvement in some of these factors. Um, because in all these papers, they show big improvement from 0.44 to 0.11. Yeah. It, it might be interesting to see if you, what you got at 0.22. So I'm just interested in your attitude towards to that. To my knowledge, there are no ensemble of simulation at that resolution. Not at least in MET Cortex. I don't think in Eurocortex either. Ensembles. Ensemble. An ensemble, yes, but they are completely different model, different, no, no, no. I mean, it's a bit, because, I mean, this simulation has been done with the constraint that the 044 and 011 was exactly the same model, same configuration, yeah, yeah. same everything. So, to compare apple and pear, it's... No, no, <laughs> it's no, we don't want to <laughs> compare apples and pears and kumquats, absolutely not. Yeah. <laughs> I actually wondered about, and we have a question there, but I also wanted to ask you, Erika, if, uh, I mean, regarding these observations, you say that they need to be homogenized and so on, but are they actually there in uh, enough resolution, inadequate resolution? I mean, the... It, I mean, the nominal resolution of these observational data set, it's really variegated. I mean, if you read in the detail of each of them, it really depends on the station density. And... Uh, I mean, most of them, they are for sure enough to cover the 011 resolution, except maybe one or two of these yeah. data set. But the main problem is they are not homogeneous. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. Um, I, want, I, I wonder how you feel about um, a uh, frequency of 10 to the minus 8 and if it's really meaningful or if you need really to use GEV to get to that. I know you can pull that out of the models, but is it really that fair, do you think? Well, it's, it's sure there are a few events, and uh, the way of showing the PDF, of course, emphasizes this tale of the distribution. We could use a more appropriate index to evaluate that. But this is more done to see the shape of the PDF and, uh, you know, where, how far does it get and in some of the regions it's really evident. That, but you are right for the... Okay, so we thank Erica there. <clears throat> and we welcome up the next speaker, uh, which is uh, Christopher Leonard uh, from the University of Cape Town. And Chris will talk on Cortex Africa, integrating climate and impact science for policy. Please, Chris. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm going to get home. There's going to be some long, obviously female hair in my hair somewhere. And my wife's going to say, where did that come from? And it was here, this mic set. 
All right, I'm going to switch gear a little bit um, from the, the key science talks that we've heard in the last few talks and just tell you a little bit about Cortex Africa. Um, the title is Integrating Climate and Impact Change for Policy, and the website for Cortex Africa is at the bottom. If you're interested in anything I say today, you're more than welcome to um, check us out. Um, Africa is over there, just in case you didn't know, it's that small country south of Europe. All right, within Cortex Africa, we've, um, we don't really run models. We analyze data that other groups run for us. Um, we don't have the capacity to run models. So we've developed a, a whole ethos of what we want to do with the downscale data that comes out of uh, Cortex. And it follows an Africa acronym where we want to analyze the data. We have a number of foci, mostly looking at meteorological and impacts uh, gaps. We have regional messages. Um, we also want to try and take an integrated approach in what we do within Cortex Africa, bringing together climate scientists and impact scientists and policy type people. Um, a really big part of what we do is capacity development. We want to generate or rather develop young African scientists and perhaps some older African scientists um, to largely take the continent forward. Europeans have done a lot for Africa in terms of climate science. We would like to step up to the plate and do some of that ourselves too. And then the last part of it is application and adaptation. We want to try and do what Bruce was talking about this morning where we're bridging that um, communications gap between the scientific community and whoever uses what we produce. In doing this, we had a series of workshops between 2012 or 2011 and 2013, and out of those workshops came, I think, 13 or 14 papers that were published in peer-reviewed scientific journals. In this effort, we formed um, three regional groupings, a West African group, an East African group, and a Southern African group that ran analyses um, on the Cortex data that we had available to us, and we produced these papers over a series of workshops that we ran um, over a period of, I think, three years or so. These are some of the papers, but more importantly, these are the people um, who are involved in Cortex Africa. These are the, the first authors of those papers that you saw and some others that you didn't see, but all young African scientists, um, except perhaps for Liana, who's in the top right. Uh, she's from Greece, but she was in South Africa for five, for five or six years, and one of her kids was born in South Africa, so she claims African citizenship that way. Um, but these are the guys we're working with, um, a really amazing team, and I'll introduce you to more of them um, later on. And these are all the authors of the papers uh, that, that were produced in that effort. In addition to that core climate science paper type development effort, we also worked with um, VIA communities, vulnerability impacts communities. So people who actually need climate information, um, not climate data, but climate information. And in Burkina Faso, um, we held a workshop that I was telling somebody uh, yesterday it was one that really changed my perspective a lot um, in terms of what I do. We had health people, media people, and climate specialists in the same room for three days. And the most important message that came out of that was that the health community does not use anything the climate community produces to do what, it, what they do in terms of reactions to malaria or types of diseases. So we learned very, very many lessons there. And the other important one was the language message that was also mentioned earlier this morning too. We had another meeting where we met with um, city managers of five different cities within Africa to figure out what, what are their needs in the peri-urban area? Uh, what are the stresses that they experience, and what climate information do they need in their decision-making frameworks. Um, and here again, we learned lots and lots of lessons. We had disaster risk management people, water people, ecology, energy, infrastructure, and climate people in the same room for three days, and it was really another amazing um, lesson or experience for us, and we learned a lot just as organizers. A lot of what we did learn from this was this is the first and probably most important part, is that as climate scientists, we have a responsibility to um, deliver information that is useful, um, that comes out through a co-exploratory uh, type of effort. But we have responsibility. We have an ethical and moral responsibility in what we do as climate scientists. Don't just throw your data out there because it's going to be misused. Get involved in the lives of the people who are using it. Um, second, continually assess all the assumptions that we have, both what we know as climate scientists and what uh, people who we're working with might know. Bring the stakeholders in really early on so that you can actually tailor what you need to do um, for them. Define the question in your climate analysis um, because then you know what you're going for. You're not producing a series of thousands of graphs that no one's ever going to need to see. Um, know your time and space scales that you're going to be working in. Understand the concepts before you attack the data. And then a really important one we learned in the workshops that we did in the, the analysis workshops was to articulate milestones, write them down. I'm going to do this by this date. And it generally gets done quite nicely. 
and design the process with long-term continuity in mind, which is what we did, but the other, the, um, the thing about this is you need funding for long-term continuity. So that was Cortex Africa phase one. We produced those papers, we developed a really good community, then everything went quiet for two years when we ran out of funding. Um, then the Swedes, God bless the Swedes, um, came to us through the Swedish um, Secretariat for Environmental and Earth System Sciences, the SSESS, and they gave us a tranche of money to try and get these workshops going again because we need to get together in the same place to talk face to face. Um, it doesn't really work um, on Skype to do this type of work on Skype, and that's what we did. Um, I've got the IPOC Center, the International Project Office for Cortex, were instrumental in, in finding this funding. Um, for us. So the Cortex IPOC, we again say thank God for Cortex IPOC. And we were able to get together in Johannesburg and largely just reconstitute the teams together, those three teams, the West, East, and Southern Africa teams. And then we also were able to develop or, or bring in a new team, the Central African team. And that was really cool to get everybody in the same room. Um, there is everybody. Um, and what we did at this meeting was really build relationships with each other. It was just a quick two-day meeting that we had. But then also start thinking about what do we want to do as Cortex Africa for the next three or four years. And these were all leaders of the um, teams. When I say leaders, it's very loosely um, used. They're largely facilitators of the workings of those groups. And we also had a quick discussion on what Cortex pilot studies uh, would be. And there's all the people that were at that meeting. Very small group, uh, but very, very useful discussions. And everything coming out of that discussion is available on the website. From that, then... Um, we got further funding from the Swedish Ministry of Environment and Energy, where we were able to bring for two workshops together um, a larger body of people. So we actually got the full teams together in Cape Town, and there are some of the people, 17 countries were represented, and there were also 23, not 21 institutions represented at this meeting. And these are the, the people involved in Cordex Africa in what we're doing. Um, if you can see in the top right-hand corner there, they're building a tower with marshmallows. So it's really important science that we were doing at these meetings. But we're developing the relationships, we're developing the groups, uh, the dynamic is really critical to do. Um, in this meeting, we developed, the, the four regional teams developed roadmaps for at least three papers each. So a total of 12 papers coming out of this. Um, one paper would look at evaluation, or it would be an evaluation-orientated paper. The second paper would look at uh, trying to understand the physical processes. You know, uh, over Africa, we know very, comparatively very little compared to what you guys know about your, your weather processes in, in Europe and other parts of the world. So we're trying to understand African climate. So it's just really just understanding African physical processes. And then also a paper that would look at projections in some way. So each of the teams committed to writing at least these papers um, by 2017. But a common thread running through all of these papers would be an assessment of added value um, within the papers. Special attention at this meeting was given to the um, inclusion of impacts modelers or vulnerability impact types modelers. And out of this discussion and having the people there came an entire new team, an additional vulnerability impacts and assessment team. So we now have five teams. We have West, East, Southern, and Central Africa, kind of core climate people. And we also have a VIA team coming out of this, um, these meetings. And that was really good. The last thing we did uh, there was actually give data to people. We had six terabyte disks worth of data um, we gave to all of the groups and they could go home to start working with the data that they needed. Um, we then had a second meeting in, no, in February, rather, this year, and these are the teams. Apologies for Grisha wearing shorts there. Those legs are sometimes a little bit bright, I suppose. Um, but those are the people, and at the second meeting uh, we had, we discussed the flagship pilot studies uh, quite a lot. We submitted one and have two more planned. You'll hear more about that, I think, tomorrow. We also discussed positioning Cortex Africa within the AR6 vision, the IPCC AR6 vision. Special attention was paid to the 1.5 degree special report, and that's the FPS we submitted. And then we discussed again the papers. So we got 12 papers, we got the milestones, and we want them all published by the end of 2017, and those are the topics that they deal with. Um, some of the results are here today or this week. Um, the first, you can have, see a, a poster by Francis um, Kruma. That's not Francis in the top right corner. That's Nana. She's a co-author. I couldn't find a picture of Francis. But he's looking at uh, extreme events off the coast of Guinea, and you can go and have a look at that on Thursday afternoon. In the Central African guys, the first thing they did was chop up Central Africa. Central Africa in that block is bigger than Europe. 
And as you know, Europe weather, European climate is just homogenous across the entire place. So when you say European weather, it's everything for everywhere, right? So they chopped it up. They weren't happy with what was defined. And then and what they're doing at the moment is an evaluation paper. So they just want to look at rainfall um, in those different regions. Uh, another paper... Um, myself and a student of mine are doing, and we're looking at high pollution events in Cape Town. Basically, uh, this is a self-organizing map Bruce mentioned earlier in the top left-hand corner, are synoptic states associated with high pollution events in Cape Town. We want to look at projected change, um, and this is the frequency. So again, in that top left-hand corner, you'll see there's an increase in the frequency of those synoptic types um, into the future. So perhaps more pollution events for us as we go into the future. Um, then another poster you can go and have a look at on Thursday is one by, by Timmy Tope, and he's looking at future changes in extreme rainfall um, and the African easterly wave. So this is a process type study that we're trying to get at. So the changes in rainfall, what's the process that's driving it? Isidine's doing a similar thing um, for process studies, but over southern Africa and changes in rainfall. Again, um, Isidine's giving a talk on Thursday at 11.15 for that. So there's stuff happening in just in these short few months that we've had here. It wasn't only work that we had at this workshop. We also went on a nice trip around Cape Town to understand it. But the reason for doing this is to develop the people. It's to de develop the group dynamic um, within um, the Cordex Africa. To, to I firmly believe if you've got the people and the people's mindsets right, the work happens by itself. And I think that's what we got in, inside Cordex Africa. We have three more, pro uh, three more workshops proposed. We haven't got funding for these yet. Fourth workshop would be a final analysis workshop where it's the last time we look at data and generate graphs, and this is largely based on what we do in the papers. Uh, fifth workshop that I would like to do is develop the VIA group because it's a young group that emerged out of uh, the November meeting. Um, developing this group and, and getting it cohesion going right is really important for us. No papers on VIA topics have come out of Cordex Africa yet, and that's what we would like to do. And then the last workshop we would hold um, would be a writing workshop where we actually nail down the papers. We get them done. 80 to 90% of the paper is done. And um, by the time we leave that workshop, and then they're all ready to publish or to submit for publication in 2017. We do understand Cordex Africa does not work alone. Or Cordex generally doesn't work in alone, alone. And it intersects with a number of different projects. I've just listed three, or initiatives rather. The first would be the Future Climate for Africa projects, and specifically the Southern African one called Fractal, where this is where the policy comes in. There are a lot of people involved in Fractal and Cordex, um, and this is the city scale uh, type of project. So in this project, Cordex people are working with actual city managers um, to think about developing policy over the next 40 years. Uh, that's the time scale of that project. But then there are also the other FCA projects, as was a, and then Helix, which is an extremes uh, project run out of the UK, um, and this speaks to our FPS proposal where we're looking at 1.5 and more degrees warming. What does that mean for us in, within Africa? And there are a couple of CR4D climate research for development initiatives um, as well that we can intersect with. So that's Cordex Africa in a nutshell. If you have any questions, you're welcome to find me. Or if you find me threatening, there's the website um, for you. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. <clears throat> so uh, any questions here? Uh, we have uh, time for a couple. Uh, do I see any hands? Uh, oh, there, me. yeah, <laughs> up there. Um, I think it's Alessandro. I could just say with this, uh, uh, with this uh, communication with stakeholders and politicians that were heard mm. several times, a few years back I heard the Finnish environmental minister at that time saying that please talk to us in a very simple way because we understand very little about very much. So maybe that's something to keep in mind. <laughs> okay, uh, thank Chris for the talk. Uh, I was wondering whether Codex Africa should focus also on observations, because especially we have areas where we don't have any, or variables we don't have, like daily temperature. I didn't hear that. Did you hear that? No, I didn't hear the question yeah, either. It didn't yeah. come through nicely. So I was wondering yeah. whether you could also focus, all, um, apart from the modeling evaluation, also on the observations, because you don't have so yeah. many for Africa, I guess. Yeah, so the, for the Central African group, this is a huge challenge because there, there is, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, not one station. Um, and I don't know how Cordex can do that except get a letter from the co-chairs of Cordex or the WGRC or CRP or whoever to say, please 
think about observations. Um, we do have satellite observations now. Um, the latest one is called CHIRPS, but we noted that even in this CHIRPS data set, which is a very high resolution in space and time um, data set, the observation stations on which CHIRPS is based drop off dramatically in 2000. So even the satellite data for us is tricky. So it's going to be a continual problem for us, our observations. So one more question up there. Yeah. yeah it's very bright. Uh, did you uh, communicate your results to the policy makers or uh, you use some model for it to how to communicate your sense to the policy? Uh, we, we try not to go directly to the policy maker. So we, it's what Bruce, I think, was mentioning earlier this morning, where uh, we get information from the GCMs. We give information to kind of what would be a, an interface person. So we try and work with the VIA modelers or with someone who will speak to the policy maker. It's very rare that we actually sit in the same room as a policy maker. We will sit in the same room um, as the policy maker's advisor or the policy maker's scientific technical team or something like that. So it, it, that, that's how the information flow we've seen has worked. That workshop in um, Dar es Salaam was different in that we did have... We, I know we only had one policy maker at that workshop. We had more technical people at that workshop who would then go and speak to the policy maker or the policy maker advisor. Okay, yeah. thank you, Chris. <laughs> and now it's time for the next speaker. The next speaker is Erik Kjellström from SMHI, uh, a, a name that is very easy because it's Swedish. And um, he will talk on production and use of Cortex projections, a Swedish perspective on building climate services in practice. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so, as Irene said, I will talk about the Swedish perspective of uh, using Cortex data for climate services. Uh, here are my, the co-authors, but I really want to acknowledge all of the Ross presenter and uh, many other people at SMHI as well who have really contributed to this work over the years. I will start very quickly, not have a long introduction, but just directly jump into the Eurocortex simulations that we have done at SMHI. So this is a table documenting uh, what we have done over the last few years in, in Cortex, and we have focused on trying to downscale as many GCMs as possible, I could say. So there is a list of 10 of these different global climate models on, in this view graph here. And as you can see there, out there on the right, we have downscaled most of them for both the RCP 4.5 and 8.5 scenarios in order to look at the spread defined by the global climate models. Uh, the red crosses illustrates simulations that have been done at the uh, Euro uh, 0.11 degrees, 12.5 kilometer resolution, as uh, Erika was talking about before. She compared the two different sets of uh, resolutions here. I will focus more on the 50 kilometer resolution runs here, since th these are the ones that we have used mostly within Sweden. There are also a couple of simulations for RCP 2.6, and uh, I will not talk too much about them anymore. Uh, there is also a column to the left saying something about the transient climate response in the global climate models, and I will get back to that later in the talk. So, performing such a huge amount of simulations requires that you have some kind of production chain, and we are not going to go through the details, and you can hardly read it here, but uh, it's important to treat all of these different steps, uh, importing lateral boundary conditions, uh, performing the model runs, post-processing and work with quality checking and uh, finally publishing the data on the ESGF nodes. That's a, it's a really huge task and people have been working for, for years with this and uh, we have now kind of a production chain to, to do this in a, in a relatively efficient way. So that's why we have been able to produce so many scenarios and not just for Europe but also for, for other cont continents. Uh, so this has been a, a big effort in this context. And uh, then this slide here shows then an example of what we can achieve with the models. We can perform a lot of simulations. And this one figure here simply shows temperature change versus precipitation change. And it's uh, for all land points in all of Europe. So it's a very uh, large and coarse scale here. But we can look at different things here as uh, 
different time periods. These are indicated by the colors. We can look at different scenarios different, uh, that are indicated by the different symbols and see how the climate change uh, evolves over time, for instance. And we can compare different simulations and have some idea about the spread and all of that. So that's basically what I'm going to say about Cordex results here. And uh, now I'm going to turn a little bit more into the climate services perspective and, and how we have uh, worked with these data and, and how to communicate that to, to uh, users in Sweden. Since, uh, I mean, these are the questions that we are addressing. Uh, if you look up to the right, uh, we have this road that has been completely eroded by a heavy rainfall event somewhere in Sweden uh, 10, 15 years ago, something like that, uh, and that happens from time to time. And uh, people are, of course, worried about this, like this young guy here, uh, what will happen in the future with that kind of phenomenon. And then we have the information on the lower right from CMIP or from Cordex, as the one I showed before. How can that be made useful to this uh, guy here or to anyone working with adaptation? Uh, in Sweden, as in all other countries, I mean, this has been an ongoing thing for a long time. And uh, I will quickly now show a timeline here, going back from 2003 to the left up till now on the right hand side. And again, a lot of text, and I will not go through all details here. But this is how SMHI has worked with this in a Swedish context. And, and uh, all of the things in blue up there are externally drivers to what we have done. I mean, there have been governmental assignments. SMHI has got the task to do something, to investigate, to, to look at uh, all of the climate scenarios somewhere, to say uh, yeah, what are the possible impacts of all of the climate scenarios that are around. There was a very big commission. This is this, uh, there is a pointer here. Uh, there was a big commission in Sweden in, the, in 2005. It got, got out with a big report in 2007. And for that one, we produced some 10,000 maps or something like that with indices based on our previous results from the Prudence uh, and the Ensemble's European projects. And that would be much of that information was building on, on regional climate model results. Uh, and then there have been other things uh, ongoing here where, where the Swedish government has assigned SMHI and other governmental bodies to take responsible for, responsibility for climate change adaptation also. And much of that has been uh, well done to the uh, county administrative boards, and I will show a map sh shortly here about that. Uh, in the lower panel here, pa part of the panel here, it's more like internally SMHI-driven things. We have been having a lot of workshops and ideas about how to go go about this, and there has also been interaction between us and other governmental bodies uh, on, on how to work with this kind of information. Since a couple of years ago, SMHI is also host for the National Knowledge Center for Climate Change Adaptation, and in that role, SMHI has a lot of co communication directly with the stakeholders, and, and this is also relating to us climate scientists. We also have to get into this kind of um, uh, communication activities uh, to present our, our results at some stages. And uh, summary, summarizing this whole process here, I mean, it's a, it has been an ongoing dialogue between SMHI and the government and the stakeholders for, for a very long time in Sweden now, for more than a decade. And it has, uh, one of the main results here has been the establishment of a web-based climate service, you can, uh, you can call it, and I will describe that in a, in a couple of minutes here now uh, to, to, to present a little bit what, what we are presenting to, to, this, to the stakeholders and to the government. And it looks like this, it's in Swedish, uh, and I will just present it anyway. There is an English version of it as well, but I thought I could as well show us this one here. So it's quite simple, you just go into the SMHI web page and you look, uh, click on climate scenarios and there you will have some, this tool showing a map of Sweden and then you can make a lot of different choices. And these choices, they have been, they are there for a reason and, and the reason is of course that the stakeholders want to have these uh, different op options and, and, and also that we can provide something that is uh, somehow reasonable uh, so we cannot provide anything and this is something we have communicated with the, with the stakeholders. So for instance, here you can see the counties in Sweden. These are the, the different regions here. And this is the county of Östergötland, where I live in Norrköping, where SMHI is. So if you click on that one, you will have a graph here showing some, some indices and changes over time and stuff like that. So um, what you can choose here on this page is a, a number of different indices and parameters. And they are based on our previous experience from this long time period here with what people are interested in and, and what uh, 
also what we can provide them with. So this is the list of the, of the current indices that are available here. They are, they are re related to temperature and to precipitation, of course, but it's not just temperature and precipitation. It's also more detailed things like uh, numbers of days when, when the, the, the temperature is crossing the zero degree line and stuff like that. So there are a number of these things there. You can also go in here and, and choose different regions. These are the counties, these are the political boundaries in Sweden, but you could also look at weather districts or uh, those are more climatological or uh, runoff regions or, or other things like that. Uh, another thing that they have, the stakeholders have asked for is to compare to the old scenarios. They did climate adaptation work 10 years ago and uh, they want now to know uh, these new scenarios that you have. Are they uh, changing something? So then you can go back here and look at the, at the old stuff and see how, uh, how if the new thing is changing anything. We are linking to the observed climate, so these are observations from, from some certain region to know something about the interannual variabilities. This is something people know. They know that what a cold year is and what a warm year is and, and what does the uh, variability in the scenarios look like here. And then, of course, we can look at the information about directions and uncertainties and, and, and all of these things. So in addition to this, there is also guidelines and documents how to use this information. And this, this is, of course, extremely important. And you don't build a climate service just by presenting a lot of numbers and, and graphs. You need also to have more information like this. Uh, we have a dialogue ongoing, as I mentioned before. And uh, there are many different things ongoing over the years. We have had working groups. We have had regular meetings. We have uh, seminars and, and there are reports written. Uh, and um, we have these climate scenarios online at the web pages, and we can often use them when we communicate with people. It's also easy to direct people to a certain site when they are interested in the snow cover, for instance. And there is a set of reports now written for each of the counties uh, in, in Sweden where, with information about possible climate changes into the future. So very quickly now, then just to say something about the impact. Uh, we know that these are being used a lot in Sweden. These are web counts on the page views of these pages for the last two years. And uh, we, can, we can see vacation period in Sweden in summer. It's very low here, so there is low activity. But then we can see other things like the launch of the thing. And when, when we promote things, when we launch new scenarios, we have a promotion on the web pages at smhi.se, and many people go in there. And there are also external factors like the COP21. There is a very big interest in this. So the final, very final thing here now, two short slides and then a summary. So uh, we often wonder if the climate change signal is robust. We have a, a set of scenarios here with uh, 10 different GCMs on the boundaries. So we can look at ensemble mean stuff like this, control period, future time period. We can look at spread over our ensemble and the uh, robustness in terms of how many simulations show an in increase or something like that. But this is still only with RCA4, so we don't take into account any other Cordex simulations here. And this is something that we should try to do in, for the future. This is one short attempt to, to look into it a little bit. And as I mentioned before, I, I looked at the transient climate response in the, in the GCMs. And we can see that the range that they cover, the models that we have accidentally picked up, uh, it's quite similar to what uh, is presented in AR5, so that's good on the global mean. Uh, if we then look at Europe and Sweden in this case, this is for the summer season, we can see all of these crosses are different CMIP5 GCMs, and the colored ones are the ones that we have downscaled. And at the end of every line here, you can find the RCA results. So you can see that RCA tends to capture a fair amount of the spread that is in there in the underlying GCMs but it narrows the spread a little bit. So the, RCA, the RCM has an impact on the results, so this is for sure, and this is something we know from before. So we need to look into more RCMs to, to make this a bit more um, robust, I would say. Uh, there are a couple of other RCMs in here. These are the open triangles, and we can also see that the climate change signal is changed differently in diff different RCMs, but this needs to be mo more comprehensively looked at. So the final picture here is the conclusions from this work. Uh, so we have found that this iterative approach is uh, informing climate services is really uh, a successful thing in Sweden at least. Uh, and we think that the results from RCA4 can be used to address um, questions around future climate in, in Sweden. But we need to look into more simulations as well. I will finish here. Uh, there is a poster tomorrow where we show results from more uh, domains over, all over the world as well. And uh, there is also a paper submitted on this to climate services, as Daniela was talking about this morning, the new paper, the new, new journal that, uh, that that is. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Eric. Um, are there 
questions for Eric? We have uh, time for maybe two. I see two hands. Yeah, uh, Rebecca up there, and then uh, so I think both were in the last room, or no? Next. Okay. <laughs> Meanwhile, while uh, she's handing out the microphone, I could ask you, you said that they could look at different scenarios of the old ones and the new ones. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, that do you was get a my lot question. Of... <laughs> was... okay. Oh, was... sorry. sorry. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> sorry. You showed that the old ones and that the stakeholders are interested in the old ones and the new ones. And you showed 8.2. Uh, A1B and 4.2. Actually, A1B is in between. It's like 6, if it would have something like that. But the, um, I think A2 is like 8.5, and what is the other? B1 is like 4.5. Have you compared these? No. Uh, is, is there any difference or added value between these? No, it's, it, you're definitely right about that. I mean, as you say, the, the scenarios are different in the levels, but people in Sweden have been, we have been delivering these scenarios to them before. They've had a large ensemble of RCA3 uh, simulations a couple of years ago with SRS A1B on the boundaries, and the, that's the results they have been using previously, and now they want to compare that to the new results that we are uh, showing them. So we have to, of course, complement that information with information about the uh, pathways of these different scenarios into the future. And, uh, so, and that's not in the maps, of course, but this is something that we can communicate to them when, when we speak to them like this. As I indicated, I mean, we have these workshops, meetings, where we really talk to the, uh, also to the stakeholders directly, and uh, then we can talk more about these issues. Uh, okay, but have you looked into the differences, actually? Uh, not so much, and, and there is also another difference here. This, as I said, that the old ones were performed with the yeah, RCA3 model and the new ones with the RCA4. Yeah. So there are slightly yeah. different versions of the model as well. So yeah. they are not, it's not a clean, it's not a clean uh, comparison. Yeah. No. I understand. Okay, so one more question. It's, um... oh. <laughs> Eric, um, you showed the, uh, in one of your slides the um, comparison of the climate change with today's observation. You had a kind of a time series ver with uh, variability in it. Um, there is in the, yeah, this one, thanks. Um, so there is in the scientific community, there's a lot of discussion about the fact that the um, climate change scenarios do not uh, mirror what is, uh, has been observed in the last years or so. Um, do you have the feeling that this is actually a discussion for the users also, or is it more a discussion in the science community? Uh, I think also among the users, it's, it's definitely important. And, and if we look at other variables like precipitation, local changes or trends in precipitation, uh, in parts of Sweden or other parts of Europe, they are often, I mean, as high as any of our scenarios for the end of the century. I mean, there could be 50% changes in summertime precipitation in, in parts of southern Sweden over the last 30 years. And so that will completely uh, mask out much of the, of the climate change signal. So that's an important issue, and they, and they are often discussing that. And uh, that is an issue to them, really, since they look at the local context. Okay, we will take the last question from the guy who waved first. <laughs> Samuel, yes. Uh, no problem. Just one point that was not clear. Uh, did you use all the Cordex simulation in your climate services or only the RCA simulation? And if no, why? So, yes, I, I said that we have, for what we have presented here, it's only the RCA simulations. And uh, the reason, again, as someone told us before, the, the main re reason that everyone asks is it's the availability of the simulation. So, so that has been the thing when these have been uh, developed over the years. In my very last slide, when I compared to also to some other, RCA, to some other RCMs, we have downloaded uh, data via the, via, via the ESGF nodes to have a larger, larger set as well. Okay, thank you, Eric, for the Swedish perspective. And... Um... <laughs> Now we move on to the last speaker for today. Uh, this is uh, Shreta Gimira, 
who will talk, uh, who's from the International Centre for Integrated Mountain Development in Nepal. And she will talk on assessment of the performance of Cordex South Asia experiments for monsoonal precipitation over the Himalayan region during present climate, part one. Thank you. Is it working? Is it working? Yeah, okay. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. As you can see the topic over here, I'm Shweta Gimire, and uh, two of my co-authors, they are also here. They, are, they have a poster session day after tomorrow. I'll hope that you'll be there. So I'm from EC Mode. If you wonder what EC Mode is, it's International Center Integrated for Mountain Development. EC Mode is a regional intergovernmental learning and knowledge sharing center serving its eight uh, regional member countries of Hindu Kush Himalaya uh, with the mission to enable sustainable and resilient mountain development for improved and equitable livelihoods through knowledge and regional cooperation. So what did we do in our, this work? We analyzed 11 Codex South Asia experiments along with their ensemble to produce monsoonal precipitation over Himalayan region. The suit uh, consists of 11 combination of six RCMs with 10 initial uh, and boundary condition from different GCMs with spatial resolution of 50 kilometers. And this work has been published in Climate Dynamics last year. So what motivated us to do this study? Himalayan region is very sensitive for climate change. It is, uh, it is known as hotspot for climate change. The precipitation sensitivity in Himalayan region is associated with Indian summer monsoon. So far, Codex South Asia experiments have not been used to evaluate the monsoonal precipitation over the re region. However, Mishra 2015 has used Codex Asians to study the climate uncertainties in three major basins of Himalayan region. Also, Mishra et al. 2014, they have used Codex RCM and host GCMs to study the extreme precipitation events over India, which cover some part of eastern Himalaya and some part of western Himalaya. So introduction, Himalaya, is, as we know, is the biggest high, highest chain of mountains forming barrier between Tibetan Plateau and southern alluvial plains. The precipitation and elevation varies as we move from east to west as well as from south to north. The reason consists of high topography reaching more than 8,000 meters. The complex topography of the region has made it difficult to manifest the precipitation pattern over the region. As stated by Anders et al., spatial patterns of precipitation over the higher altitudes are characterized by the remarkable and persistent variation on the scales of 10 of kilometers. And Indian summer monsoon, as I said earlier, it plays a vital role in the Himalaya. It contributes more than 80% of precipitation in the eastern Himalaya and only 30% in western Himalaya, whereas uh, western Himalaya receives more of its precipitation by western disturbance. And due to lack of proper network of in-situ measurement of precipitation stations in the mountainous region, enough data cannot be collected in this region. So moving on to data and methodology, I'll discuss more on this. As I said earlier, the study region is Himalayan region. Uh, it consists of some part of Hindu Kush Himalaya and some part of Karakoram Himalaya as well. So Codex and his experiment, I don't have to explain much on this. Uh, I, we acquired the data from IITM Pune. So this, these are the experiments we have used with their driving GCMs and RCM, the, which used as for down, dynamical downscaling. Observation data set, we used three greeted observation data set, Aphrodite, GPCC, and CRU. Aphrodite is a daily precipitation available at 0.25 spatial and temporal resolution, whereas GPCC and CRU were available for monthly data at 0.50 spatial and temporal resolution. From the time period, we choose 1970 to 2005 for pre present study, and months we choose June to September, as this is, this is the dominant monsoon season for the region. And you can see the coordinates as well. So the, coming into discussion of observation data sets, we can see that Aphrodite, it, it's 
It's able to represent the precipitation over the region. It has been able to capture the spatial variation of the precipitation, whereas CRU, it has captured less precipitation. And this is the mean annual cycle of precipitation over the given period for the given study region. Here you can see that most of the experiments show peak in June, whereas uh, observation with uh, LMDZ, IITM LMDZ, and ICHG, CE, EC Earth, SMHI, RCA4 shows peak in July. Due to the closeness of the model, EC Earth, SMHI, RCA4, we have chosen this as a better performing experiment for the region, and I've, uh, I'll refer to that experiment as ICHEC in the later slides. Uh, this is the precipitation climatology for the given period. Uh, here you can see that the figure B and C, there's quite less precipitation, and figure J, ICHEC, it shows spatial vari uh, variation of the precipitation, similar to that of the observation Aphrodite. And this is the precipitation bias. ICHEC shows less bias compared to other experiments. And this one is the number of grid points at particular elevation per 1,000 meter of elevation. Uh, above 4,000 meter of elevation, we can see that precipitation magnitude is uh, below 5 millimeter per day, and whereas uh, below 3,000 meter of elevation, precipitation is more dispersed. Uh, uh, this, this one is for observation, and this one is for all the experiments along with their ensemble. Here you can see that above 4,000 meter of elevation, uh, the precipitation is less biased, whereas in the lower elevation, it's more dispersed, similar to the observation. Uh, this is a standard deviation for all the experiments along with the observation and their ensemble. Here you can see that uh, in observation data set, the standard deviation is quite low compared to few points in eastern, towards the eastern Himalaya. And similar result is shown by ICHEC. Sorry. Um, this is a time series seasonal JJS precipitation for all the experiments along with the uh, observation and ensemble. Here you can see that two of the experiments, they are showing quite less precipitation compared to the observation, which is shown in bold green line. Uh, figure, uh, this figure, figure on the left top, it shows the standard deviation of precipitation of 11 experiments. It shows a higher standard deviation towards the eastern side and towards the southern slope of the Himalaya. On the top right, you can see the temporal plot of ensemble spread, where red line represents the ensemble mean, blue line represents the observation. The shaded gray line is the mean and maximum precipitation observed in particular year, and purple box, they are the plus minus one standard deviation of mean ensemble for that particular year. The figure on the bottom right, uh, it's the, the black bold line is the mean uh, observation precipitation. Dashed line are plus minus three standard deviation for the observation. Points are the mean precipitation for all the experiments. In this figure, you can see that only one of the experiments uh, seem to fall, come below the plus minus three standard deviation of the of the observation. So we, that's why we chose this model. And as discussed in earlier figure also, uh, ICHEC was performing better than other. That's what we observed. Uh, so. The figure on the left, it's a special correlation of JJS precipitation of ICHEC ensemble with observation. Here you can see that uh, ensemble has good correlation compared to the experiment we have chosen. And figure on the right is a temporal correlation of precipitation 
for ICHEC and Ensemble. Here you can see that ICHEC is showing negative correlation compared to the Ensemble. And so in some part, of, uh, some part of the region, ICHEC is showing positive correlation as well. Correlation is up to 0.6. So Taylor diagram show, show, showed the statistical comparison of seasonal mean of precipitation for, of all the experiments with the observation. Here you can see that uh, two of the experiments, one is ICHEC and one, another one is uh, the experiment using Cosmos CLM. They have uh, standard deviation closer to the observation, which is shown with a blue, green square box at the bottom. The top right figure, it shows the um, association of precipitation of experiment and the ensemble with the observation. It shows that more, more of the magnitude of the precipitation lies below 10 millimeter per day, and more the points are lying closer to the line. They are more associated with the observation. The last one is the probability distribution function showing that observation and the experiment is showing higher magnitude of precipitation towards the lower range of the scale, whereas Unshumble is showing higher in the middle range. So the conclusion, due to sparseness of distribution of observation stations, the graded observation data sets capture very less precipitation. The study of precipitation in this region is very complex due to topography and orography. Precipitation pattern widely vary in the region, and most of the experiments show wet condition. So the next paper, it's in process. So yeah, thank you. I want to okay, okay. Thank you, Shweta. And uh, we have uh, time for a couple of questions. Um, yes, I see one there. Yes, uh, I, I noticed that the, the GFDL model, it is underpredicted. Uh, I mean, always give uh, much lower values than other model. And we found the same result in uh, MENA domain, the one uh, in, uh, was presented this uh, morning. So my question, when one of the model is really, I mean, project much lower value. Do we need to include in the, in the ensemble? So I don't hear clearly. The GFDL model? Yeah. You present it? I mean, when you, you, when you present the ensemble and the different model. The, the ensemble and 11... Yeah, the GFDL expert. is the project much yeah, lower yeah. value. Yeah, it's showing quite low. And we have the same result in MENA, MENA domain. Okay. I mean, we apply. So why we need to include GFDL model if it always, I mean, project lower value than other? Yeah. So when we used all the experiments, we chose all 11 experiments. Actually, there are more than 11 experiments, but when we started our work, there was data available for only 11 experiments. We tried to remove GFDL, but to show all the results, like how the models are performing, how the experiments are performing over the region, we kept it. Was there any more questions? Um, I can't see any more hands, but uh, I have, uh, oh yeah, there is one more. I can ask meanwhile, is there plenty of observations? Because we heard that a lot about scarcity of observations. Do you have that problem as well? Yeah, there are like few observations there. And Aphrodite was one of the reliable observations, but they stopped after 2007. Yeah, thank you very much for the presentation. I have a comment which is related to the last question, and actually it is also related to the question by Filippo uh, this morning to Bruce. How many, what number can you give me? 42 or something like this. How many simulations do we need? So, um, I mean, you mentioned that there is, that it seems that there are some models who perform always different than others, and this is the same in different regions, let's put it this way, very carefully. Um, and I think the, the last years, Cortex, and with all the simulations as we see here, being uh, analyzed now for different regions of the world, made great progress in coming up with these 
figures and showing the different behavior in today simulating today's climate or in climate change simulations. But I think for the next years, it is our task to understand why are they doing this. So I think this is, is very clear, clearly related to can we discard some models because they are unreasonable? Do we really get the full range of possible climate changes or are we still working with subsets? And uh, only besides, is there, a, let's say, one model seems to be an outlier. Does it mean it is unreasonable or is it not unreasonable? So I think we have to find the, the mechanisms now to, during this conference and, and maybe for the future years, to, to find the reasoning behind these in either process analysis or I don't know what, um, so that we can, we can make a step forward towards a more robust answer and not uh, stay on a descriptive uh, level as we are currently. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Maybe that can wrap this sec uh, session up. Thank, thank you, Shweta. You.